Because most people who talk about weed classified as a drug, there's no middle ground for it. And then they kind of say, well, you know, weed's bad. It's always going to be bad. But you had a weed brownie and you had this really amazing Yeah. Experience. And at the time I was terrified and I hated it and I wanted it to end. But one of the most important things that happened to me, and I think it's because I think I and maybe a lot of people all we ever think about is what we want. Like, how can this serve me? And uh, how can I get from here to here? And when that happened, when I, when I was on that brownie, I just was looking at myself like way more introspective than ever before. It's like, like, again, it's like, who am I? And um, I'm not perfect. You know, I'm far from it. And I guess I just never really sat back and looked at myself. You know, I kept, I, I kept feeling sorry for myself because I had a stroke and because I can't do this and do that. But um, I started actually thinking about other people's feelings, I suppose. Um, and, and the way that I affect them. And I don't, I just really didn't want to be a negative effect on people. I really didn't. I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted, if people were going to remember me, I wanted to remember me positively. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. I am Bill Gassiamis, your host, and recently Spotify released a new feature which allows people to rate their favorite shows in the same way that the Apple podcast app allows it. So if you think that the show deserves it, I'd love it if you left us a five-star review. This will help the show rank better on search engines. It'll help newly diagnosed stroke survivors find the show, and it could make a massive difference in their recovery. So go to your favorite podcast app, share what the podcast means for you. It It literally will make a huge difference, not only to stroke survivors, but also to their caregivers, who, as you know, do a tough when they have to deal with somebody who is recovering from stroke after being a regular person and just going about life and then suddenly becoming a stroke survivor caregiver. Now, this is episode 188, and my guest today is Jake Strauss, who got in touch with me after he listened to an episode of the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Chris Martin, who was on episode 175. And Chris is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu participant, coach, and he experienced a stroke as a result of a chokehold, uh, a, a technique that creates uh, the person who's being choked out to tap out or to submit and therefore to lose the bout. Now, Jake also experienced a ischemic stroke caused by a vertebral artery dissection that was caused by a chokehold. And it seems that it's really a thing that's happening in the world of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as the sport is becoming more and more popular, that people are being injured. Now, what that means is that I'd love it if you shared this episode so that we can raise awareness in that sport about how people become injured in the neck and in their either carotid arteries or their vertebral arteries. And as a result of that experience, ischemic strokes, that are caused by clots that occur after a uh, a tear in one of the main blood vessels that lead to the heart gets damaged from being uh, pressurized or being squeezed by the arms of somebody in a Brazilian jiu-jitsu bout. So with that being said, I am really keen to raise awareness in this space of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So please do share with anyone that you know that is in the sport and hopefully we'll make a difference, at least help those guys recognize the signs of stroke and then go through the process of uh, helping people who may be experiencing signs of stroke. So when Jake experienced his stroke, uh, he had to spend time away from his beloved martial art, which tested his identity, made him reassess who he was and how he participated in the world. It brought him closer to his family and friends and made him a better competitor and a better human being jake strauss welcome to the podcast it's good to be here you know what i do to 
get people back really quickly that I haven't spoken to uh, for a long time that I've connected with so much is I press record, I, I, I get them onto a podcast like a week ago, and then we talk for an hour and a half. And then I tell them I forgot to press record so that I've got to get them <laughs> back in a week so we can talk again. Um, I so much enjoyed our conversation literally a week ago that I forgot to press record on. I'm just so glad that I was able to get you back again. Yeah, man. No, I, I regret nothing. You know, that was, it was a really good talk. I'm sure we're going to have another really good conversation, but yeah. Was pretty cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, your, the interest in having you come on board to the podcast was uh, as a result of an interview that I did with Chris Martin, who is a jujitsu um, uh, enthusiast to say the least. And he's a coach and um, he's somebody that's been around the sport for a long time. And he was injured because of uh, what's commonly referred to as a choke where uh, people in the sport in order to submit somebody um, will will we'll put pressure on the carotid arteries or the vertebral arteries heading towards the neck to stem the blood flow so that they can pass out or tap out before hopefully they pass out. And uh, Chris was saying that the issue for him, he believes, is that that damaged one of his um, arteries. And as a result of that, it created a, a, a tear, which caused a clot and caused a stroke. His back at training and um, he's doing really well, but he wants to spread awareness. He wants people to know about the risks of the carotid artery dissections, um, especially in the sport of jujitsu, because it's, you know, where he hangs out, it's where all his friends are, it's where all his mates are. And he was really concerned about uh, that issue. So he came on, he approached me to come onto the podcast. And as a result, he has started raising awareness because you found the podcast and you felt that it was appropriate to reach out. Tell us a little bit about what happened to you. Um, well, with me, um, I competed at a tournament and um, it was a pretty regular day. It went really well. It was successful for me. And um, right when I had gotten home about two and a half hours after the tournament, um, I just went cross-eyed and um, one eye was just looking at the floor and uh, you know, I got rushed to the ER by my friend and um, we ended up finding out that I had a clot in my brain and uh, it, it took a little portion of my vision, but um, that was the only part of me that was affected by, uh, by the stroke that I had. What's it like when one of your eyes is cross-eyed seeing down like how does it affect you your stability how does oh. it affect you one eye is working properly and one one eye is facing the other direction yeah i mean it's you uh it's it's almost worse than blindness because you can see and it's completely distorted type of vision so everywhere that you think something is it actually isn't and um but what i always tell people is the sidewalk was on top of the grass so um was completely unaware of where I was stepping when I was walking. And my friend, he would, he grabbed my hand and was guiding me because I, I just couldn't see properly. Mm. You know, I could see, but everything I was seeing was in the wrong spot. And um, it was really terrifying. I had no idea what was going on. Um, it just, it just kind of started and I thought that's weird. And it just got more and more distorted and, and I was just fully crossed. Um, I couldn't see what I looked like, but I had a feeling that, that, um, I would look off and my friend said, yeah, your eye is looking totally at the floor. And it was, um, it's never good when doctors say I've never seen that. Um, they told me when people have a lazy eye, it goes left or right. It doesn't go up or down. And, uh, mine went directly at the floor. So that it was, it was interesting. It isn't good when doctors say I haven't seen that before. That's definitely not good. You no. want to go to a doctor that has seen everything before so that they know how to help you, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, I don't want to be a unique case. Like, you know. The eye is looking good now as far as its position is concerned. 
but how is the vision is the vision restored as it as it was um no definitely not as it was it it might be better than when i first got out of the hospital but um it's a it's a small portion of my vision it's in the it's in the upper left area it's not peripheral a lot of people say oh you're missing peripheral vision that's not true because when i go far enough out of it i can see it it's it's like right here and then i start getting it back um particularly when i look down it must be just the spot in my vision when i look down the the spot that's a little up and to the left really really is just missing it's it's dark um so I think we talked about it last time. It's uh, one of the most annoying things. It's like reading subtitles for uh, for a show, and then the and then everybody's face disappears on the TV. So that that can be pretty um, annoying. Okay, so no foreign language movies for you, my friend. Yeah, exactly. I can't watch anime and all that stuff without without a little bit of a struggle. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, so that's not too bad as far as that's could have been worse i mean I, I hate to say that anyway it's bad enough you had a stroke but that came back how long did it take to get back to get back uh my vision yeah to get back your vision and your eye to sort of go straight did it go straight how did they get it back um i don't know if they even did anything uh, I, re I remember when the nurse was kind of sitting with me and was like hey your eye looks it looks like it's back to normal it took about took about 40 minutes to an hour um you know i was, I was definitely cross-eyed when they got me to the hospital they put me in a wheelchair um they they rolled me up they got me to a bed and um it was just kind of sitting and waiting uh, i don't they gave me they didn't give me any drugs to help they put dye in me i remember that they they put dye in me to um be able to see my veins and stuff um but yeah, it took about 40 minutes and then it kind of went back to the center. And, and uh, when I had that, that dark spot missing, so I don't know if you've ever had that, but sometimes when you stare at something, like if you stare at the sun, you know, you kind of get like this like dark, that's kind of what I thought happened. I was like, oh, that'll go back to normal. And then I eventually realized like, that is just how it is now. And how old were you and how long ago was it? I was 24. It was, it was in August 7th of last year. So it was about six or seven months ago now. Mm -hmm. At 24, had you ever had, through the sport that you are you participate in, have you ever had any serious injuries that you can look back on and go, you know, this sport's pretty difficult on the body or it's brutal or? Yes, I've had several, to be honest. Had a lot. Yeah. Um, nothing like that. Nothing ever scared me like that. Nothing ever made me feel like, you know, this is going to affect my actual life. A um, lot, lot of setbacks. I've, I've lost, I've lost about two years to injury of just, you know, having to sit. So um, it's, it's something I'm used to coming back from injury and recovering and, you know, trying to stay positive, but nothing was like a stroke. No, nothing felt more defeating for a little while than that. And with injuries, physical injuries caused because of the combat side of the sport, there's a timeline usually, isn't there? Don't they usually sort of say, this is the timeline and in X amount of months, you'll be back on your feet or using your arm again, and then it'll continue to get better and stronger and you rehabilitate it and all that stuff. Is that what your experience yes. has been in the past? Definitely. They've always been able to kind of give me a timetable, you know, they like when you, when you injure your knee really bad, you know, it's usually like three to six months and, uh, you know, same thing, shoulder. Um, I've, I've had a lot of injuries. I've cracked my tailbone multiple times. That's, that's the worst pain I've ever had in my life is the tailbone. Is that from falling onto the mat or onto the ground? I, I fell on someone's knee and uh, someone need me in the in the tailbone by accident i had one of those door pull-up bars i fell doing pull-ups on that so uh yeah it just i, I hope i never injured again because that is the worst mm -hmm. this is the worst one by far it recovered quicker than the other ones but the pain is unbelievable in the beginning for that one 
So what's it like now that your eye is, well, you're recovered, but your eye has lost vision? What's it like comparing that or thinking about that to the other injuries? How do you kind of reconcile the difference in the two? One of them won't kind of ever go away. It'll always be there, although technically you're healed. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly how I look at it. It's like, you know, the other ones involve more pain, but this one was uh, mentally painful because, and it's like, uh, this is my new reality. So I don't get as upset about it anymore, but getting back from the hospital, coming home, it was very hard because it's like, I just wanted that visual field to be there and it wasn't. And it's like, it's very frustrating as somebody who's had a hundred percent of the vision all their life. To, to be missing a good portion of it. Um, and we talked about it last time. It's like, it's just, it's just a constant reminder. And um, right here in my room, I don't feel like I notice it as much, but when I'm in a big, well-lit area, that's when I really kind of notice it. You know, when there's a big, broad uh, spectrum to look at, that's when I, when I see that I'm missing part of it. And it just reminds me that I had a stroke and, and you know, this is, this is a lifelong thing I'll probably have to, uh, deal with does it also remind you that you're mortal or is it just reminding you you had a stroke what's the what's the big deal about it i mean you know why why is it affect, affecting you why is it why, why was it so difficult to reconcile at the beginning which part of it yeah i think you're right about that mortal thing i mean it, it um it definitely makes me a little worried it reminds me that something like that could happen again but um i think in the beginning it, not only was it that but it was just grieving for the loss of a part of me if that makes sense like i mean uh i just i you know it's one of the reasons i don't have tattoos is uh i don't have anything against tattoos and i think they look good but i don't like permanent things and uh feeling like it's permanently gone really disturbed me in a strange way that it's hard to put into words but it just was really disturbing to me if that um makes any sense do you like permanent good health that's okay yeah i'm all right with that <laughs> yeah good so i'm glad <laughs> uh yeah i suppose your sport is really hard on the body any combat sports are especially uh boxing it doesn't seem to stop a lot of people getting in the ring again and again and again and again. Is there any, did it ever cross your mind that I'm not going to do this anymore, that I have to stop this? Yes. And it was, uh, it was the most depressing part of my life for sure. I've never felt more. I built an identity out of this. Um, it's what I felt like made people start liking me. Cause I kind of was, an outcast growing up. I always felt like I was on the outside of stuff and I've always felt mediocre. I've always felt like, you know, I'm not terrible at anything, but I'm also not very good at anything. And this is the first time it's like, I was really good at something and people respected me for it. So when I felt like I lost it, um, it was just, it was the hardest thing I ever had to deal with. And um, really like, I just tried not to think about it. Cause when I thought about it really being over it just would uh it would just kill me inside honestly did it really feel like you were going to lose friendship respect uh was it an ego thing was it what was it specifically that you yeah. were afraid of i think my ego was definitely involved and um you know i guess i didn't think people would stop being friends with me but it's i was also thinking of the new friendships and it's like it's just like, this is what people know me for. Like, I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not even me anymore if I can't, which I don't think is true now, but I mean, it was a, it was a real thought of mine. And um, it, it was kind of hard to picture where I was going to go from there and, and what, what would be uh, consuming my time in the future. At 25, at 24, this is, reminds me of, of a midlife crisis the description that you've given it because i'm 47 and i haven't really had a, a midlife crisis i don't know what people do my stroke didn't cause one i didn't think about my identity changing 
becoming negative in any way. I just saw it all as a positive. I thought, wow, I get to reset and redo things completely different again because I can't do things the way that I used to. And now I have this new awareness about life being um, interrupted by serious health issues, one that could have killed me. And there's so much I haven't experienced. There's so much I haven't done. There's so much I haven't tried. There's so much I haven't um, spoken about, etc. That now's the time to do it because I don't know when life is over. And even though I'm 37, and it took me a good five or six years to get back on my feet, uh, where I started to feel myself again, uh, I had a lot of I had a lot of concern about life might end soon and I might have missed out on all these things. So let me just go after them now. And then if life is long, which I expect it to be into the eighties and beyond, then I will have had another 40 years of experiencing all this awesome stuff that I didn't do for the first 40 odd years. And it was I've never, my identity has never been so rigid, so stuck in one position that when it was, when all my faculties were taken away from me, that I felt like, oh shit, I've got to get back to my painting job. Like, yeah, I never thought that. Perhaps because I wasn't so passionate about my job as you are about your sport and how you've grown into it and how it's grown around you and how it's become a, such a massive part of your life. But yep. when people get to a midlife crisis in their 40s or 50s, it's often, I see it in mums, a lot of mums who have been caregivers for their kids and then their kids fly the nest and it's like, what, what do I do now? How do I yeah. go about my life now? I've got all these things that I want to give to my kids that they don't need anymore. Who do I give them to and what do I do with that time? And who am I really? And how do I fit in this world now that I'm not a mum the way that I used to be a mum? So it kind of reminded me of that, what you said. You've had 40, 24 years on the planet. Yeah, then you have a stroke and then it's like, well, who am I now? I think what I'm trying to get at is a really good thing to do for people who are listening and watching is actually understand that your identity is not just the one thing that you do or you participate in there's got to be multi levels of identity in that and for example in in jiu-jitsu it might be yeah i'm a combatant i get into the ring but also i have these other elements that i can participate in the sport in say i can't get back in the ring ever again for whatever reason i could do uh training or i could I don't know, make jujitsu footwear. I, I don't know what the word is or what the term is, but perhaps there is more than just I'm a combatant on the ring. Uh, yeah. That, that I, and that's how I identify my entire life with and nothing else matters. Um, perhaps I'm naive because I'm not into a sport where you are and you're trying to be the best because you don't, you don't muck around. You, you definitely tell people that you want to be the best at it and you want to compete at a high level. So maybe you, you have to be more narrow minded at that level. I don't know, but I thought I'd throw that out there. Just sort of see what comes back. How do you feel about what I've just said? I think it's right. I think that um, I was narrow minded. I still am just maybe a little less, but there is more to life than jujitsu. There's more to life than your hobbies or like the one thing you do. And I, you know, we talked about it last time. It was like one of the biggest things was like uh, how I treat my family and my friends. Like I, I want to be more available to them um, at least like emotionally than I was. And um, having the stroke, it was, it was devastating at the time, but, it's done so many good things to me as a person and um, not only to like treat people better, but also another thing you mentioned is like, I take risks now. 
I do things that I normally would have said no to, or just been like, I don't, you know, I was like, I'll buy the plane ticket. I'll go, I'll, I'll do whatever because I need to, I need to experience life because we don't live forever. And I don't want to, I don't want to regret it. I don't want to say, well, I didn't really do anything, but, but go to class um, my whole life, you know? So it's, it's done a lot to, to put things into perspective about, about who I am as a person and, and just like what, what I could still do outside of, outside of my one, my one focus. How come, how come there was no time for your family? Cause everything was about training and everything was about competing. And, um, you know, it's like there, there's not a, and, and also I, I, I don't want to just put it to that. I think I was just a rigid, like, you know, sometimes a hard person to get along with and maybe I still am, but I'm a little better now. Um, you know, I think we talked about it. I kind of had an epiphany cause I, I ate a weed brownie that was a lot stronger than I thought it would be. And I mean, everything just flooded my mind and it was like, I don't hug my mom enough. I don't, you know, I'm not nice to my sister. I'm not nice enough to my friends. Um, just, just a lot of things. And, and a big part of it was the stroke was being like, I can't believe this happened to me at 24. Like this is, this doesn't seem like my reality. Like it, it really felt unreal. It was like, this is, this really happened. And um, it's like, who am I, who am I right now? You know, it's like, I don't want to be this person basically yeah in we don't necessarily advocate anyone taking anything that that they shouldn't take especially when they're recovering from a stroke right but i have had a weed brownie before and i've had also done mushrooms before so i actually understand that part of what you're saying, but for the people that don't understand it, can you give us a little bit of an insight into what, what, what happened? Like, how did you have this epiphany? I know that we kind of got you into this space, but how does that happen? How do you go there? And then how do you get such a good outcome from this? Because most people who um, talk about weed classified as a drug there's no middle ground for it and then they kind of say well you know weed's bad it's always going to be bad but you've had a weed brownie and you had this really amazing yeah experience. and at the time i was terrified and i hated it and i wanted it to end but one of the most important things that happened to me and i think it's because i think i and maybe a lot of people all we ever think about is what we want like how can this serve me and uh how can I get from here to here? And when that happened, when I, when I was on that brownie, I just was looking at myself like way more introspective than ever before. It's like, like, again, it's like, who am I? And um, I'm not perfect. You know, I'm far from it. And I, I guess I just never really sat back and looked at myself. You know, I kept, I, I kept feeling sorry for myself because I had a stroke and because I can't do this and do that. But, um, I started actually thinking about other people's feelings, I suppose, um, and and the way that I affect them. And I don't. I just really didn't want to be a negative effect on people. I really didn't. I wanted. I wanted to. I wanted if people were going to remember me, I wanted them to remember me positively. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. In hindsight, this disconnection from your family when you were 
just fully into your sport and your training, was it making you a better or a worse fighter? You know, I, that is a really good question. I'm not sure. I can tell you, I think I'm the best I've ever been right now. And um, I am more available to people. So maybe, maybe I was, um, I, I think it's important for people to enjoy their life and do what they like. So I would say maybe it actually negatively affected me because I think I focused so much on one thing and, and I maybe wasn't enjoying myself as much as I, as I should have outside of it. Although sounds, I loved it, but. Sounds like there ahead. wasn't a lot of balance. Yeah, exactly. It was like this, you know, this is jujitsu right here and this is everything else. So. Mm -hmm. And how are your family now that you have more time for them? How are they enjoying you more? They definitely, they definitely like it more. Um, my sister says I'm so different than I used to be, you know, and, and I'll just take her word for it because I can't, I can't really speak because I'm me, you know, I don't really think I'm that much different, but it's more like what I hear from people. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a niece, she's, she's about to turn one in about a month or two. So, um, I want to be around for her, you know, um, I, I think they're, I think they're enjoying it a lot more. Um, they're terrified because I'm still competing and, and I'm back in it, So they don't want anything bad to happen to me. By the way, something new that I wanted to add that, that has changed since we spoke is um, both my sisters are doing private lessons with me and they love it. And um, they're, uh, I love that they're starting to really like jujitsu and I feel like they're actually starting to understand me more by understanding jujitsu. And it's, and it's something you spoke about with your son from uh, speaking with me, you kind of also got like an insight into your son's mindset, right? I, I'm devastated when I hear somebody had a, a carotid artery dissection in jujitsu. I'm devastated because my son is fully into it. I mean, he's fully into it. And man, this is a kid that did fit in. This is a kid that did have friends. This is a kid you know, that, that we created the perfect environment for him and all this bullshit, you know, around his life so that he didn't need to find himself and all this junk, right? That, you know, we thought in our heads, right? So we were a typical suburban, uh, you know, Australian family and we just go about life and we try and do the best for everybody and ourselves and we work hard and we do all that sort of stuff. And then my son says, oh yeah, I found this sport. It's like jujitsu. It's like, wow, awesome, right? I just see people need who participate in jujitsu, punching the heck out of each other in a ring. And I, I can't deal with it because I've had an injury to my head. I've had brain surgery. There's a, you know, there's a screws holding my skull together. And I'm like, the last thing I need in my life is people going anywhere near my head. There's no chance I want to do that, right? And he tells me about all these amazing humans that he's met at jujitsu, you know, his coach and these and his um, the other participants and you know his teammates and it's like he feels like he's part of this community that he's never really felt although he always was a popular kid this level of community I don't think he ever had before yeah and they've, got, a, they've got his back sorry. and he's got their back you know and he's telling me these things and I'm relating to it in my other non-combative communities you know where the people are amazing. And I'm, I'm like, wow, like, how can this be possible anyway? And then my son will say to me, I'm going to go see the fights. And then every once in a while, I'll sit down and watch the fights with him. You know, we'll watch the um, Joe Rogan interview uh, some of the best fighters in the world for the MMA bouts and all that kind of stuff. And, and you get beyond the fact that all they're doing that what they're doing is just hitting each other you know that there is strategy involved you know that there is controlling emotions you know that there is controlling your breath you know that there is um practicing or implementing what you've practiced for months and months and months and there is so many life lessons and you get to practice them and experience them in that time for the amount of rounds that you're in that ring for. And, and there's not many things in life where you get to practice your craft in such a intense and hostile environment. 
most of us just practice our craft in a benign environment but you guys you get you get to practice it under duress all the time and it's like far out man i take my hat off to you guys i, I don't know how you do it and i'm glad that i don't do it and i would never do it but i really appreciate the fact that people get into the ring and put themselves at risk they are and i think we're all a little crazy i think um there's just a different mindset for people who love that kind of stuff and uh, you know i wish i could explain it better but um you know there's it's not about for a lot of people, it's not about wanting to hurt somebody else. It's about um, a super competitive nature and maybe even like a dominant kind of thing where it's like you just want to be recognized as um, the best. And, um, you know, it's like that for other people, it might be just uh, violence. But for them, as you said, it's strategy. It's it's being the smartest. It's being the best at their craft. And uh their craft just happens to involve punching people and kicking people, you know? I, uh, you know, I don't want to, and I want to see beyond that part as well. Like it's just, it isn't just that it's, that's one of the things that happens in that, but I'm thinking about it from the perspective of, uh, self-defense as well. Uh, there's an aspect to that. Not that we need to be completely aware of the fact that, uh, perhaps we need a high level of self-defense. Self-defense is kind of like it's an insurance policy. It's something that you do in case something happens in the future so that you can protect yourself. But I see the merits of people who are like me, who are not usually combatant and who wouldn't know how to have a proper fight. Uh, I see it being really uh, a useful skill to know how to disarm somebody or how to uh, bring somebody to the ground and dominate them in a position of and get into a position of power so that you take away their opportunity or their ability to harm you and to yep. uh, attack you. I see that as a way, way more beneficial part of the sport. And I suppose the fact that you guys get to practice it so much means that you will be very good in a situation like that if it was ever to arise and also to help other people if it ever arises um because you can you can just act you can just move rather than go into fight or flight and freeze and don't know exactly what to do yeah and um and i mean the reason it's so well tested is because we play the game in practice we don't um pretend to play it we don't drill it and then never actually go into the live situation like in some sports it's easier than others like you know you could always play a live basketball game in practice but um i think i think there's a place for everything but as far as self-defense you know there are people who teach you it they'll show you the move but um then they won't have you use it in a real situation mm. so it's like all we do at jujitsu is just go into real situations now it might not be like a street fight situation but it's still applying your technique against somebody who doesn't want you to do it. So you'll see how it works. And um, so you're a very kinesthetic person. Uh, that means you love touch, you love feeling, you love movement, you love all of that. My son, he'll often say to us, don't come near me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. But then he gets involved in a sport like jujitsu with a grappling and people are all over each other the whole time. And he does that willingly. So I'm curious, is, is that kinesthetic, that feeling, that touching part of it, a really important part of the sport? Is it something that you lacked or missed as a younger kid? Is it something that has added to your life, that being so close to somebody, even in that strange, you know, weird uh, grappling position? I think that's why we're so close. I think that's why you see, like, people treat each other like family, because it's like, we're up close and personal we're touching each other every day and you know we shake hands we hug after practice we all stay after and we talk and um, I think it absolutely makes us closer than another sport or another activity you know you see your friend at work and you say hi but like imagine if you were fucking engaged sorry uh, but and, and really close quarter activity all the time um, and I and I'm kind of like your son's like I didn't like hugs and kisses growing up you know I was not that guy I was not that kid 
So um, it's weird that I'm okay with it as long as we're trying to strangle each other and break each other's arms. But um, <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. He'll give us a hug and a kiss when he comes over and when we go to his place or whatever, when we meet somewhere. And um, that's all good. But, you know, those sometimes when, as a parent, you want to go and hug your kid and it's like, no, no, don't touch me. I don't want to be touched. Don't yeah. touch me. <laughs> so yeah. standoffish, but that's all right. So your sisters, are you surprised by their level of ability or did you learn something about them that you didn't know? Because combat sports like that often teach you something deep and uh you know about their dark side did you get to experience something different from your sisters yeah and uh you know it's funny i think it goes back to what you just said it's like we did not hug a lot neither was my i think my middle sister would like hugs but me and my oldest sister are very similar and we're just not giving them out much so um this is the closest we've ever been. We've never, we've never uh, touched each other so much. We've never been this like, so, I mean, that's a, that's a whole new thing, but also um, seeing how my sister, she listens well. And um, it, I would say she's actually had trouble with criticism before, but she's very good at dealing with the criticism from me when I'm coaching and saying, no, that's not right. No, you know, she never talks back. And uh, that's something I'm really appreciative of and and um you know she she wants to learn and i respect that a lot too um my other sister she she just tried it for the first time but um it's it's hard for her because she she laughs at everything she says sorry every time because she's so like nervous about hurting somebody or whatever so it'll be interesting to see her kind of get more comfortable with it um but but yeah i mean i just I never expected us to all do this together. It's a really, it's a really good bonding experience. You know, and again, it's like, I get to show them what I love more than anything in the world. So um, it's hard to not bond over that. Yeah. I do. I do love that. Jiu-Jitsu brought you guys together and made you yeah. a family. It's just brilliant that, that that's why I, I, it's important for me to speak about Jiu-Jitsu. It's what we're doing is we're raising awareness about the injury caused to somebody's neck is that if you notice somebody in jiu-jitsu for example whose eye has changed direction if you notice somebody whose mouth has drooped who's not speaking correctly who is not able to feel one side of their body who is not walking the right way that they were walking just before who's saying something strange don't take don't take it lightly like take it really seriously and get that person help immediately because what we don't want to do is make assumptions that uh, you'll be right or you'll work, walk it off or it'll get better. No, because if it's something happening neurologically, we need to take action really quickly. We want to make sure that people see jujitsu as not being just a sport that injures people's brains because it does so much more than that. It, and it's, and people's brains get injured even out of sport. So what about me? Just regular life, just walking around and being myself. I mean, it'd be such a silly thing to say life. Sometimes if you're just living your life, you get a brain injury, you know, quit living or quit doing that thing that you were doing beforehand. It's nuts. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a doctor's like go-to is, oh, you were doing that and you, and you had this happen. Well, just don't do that anymore. It's like, yeah. well, it's not that simple. That might be a major part of my life, whatever that is. Yeah. So um, sometimes we need help just working around it, but. Yeah, it's brought me major awareness and, and I tell people all the time and I think I'm a good person to tell you because I didn't quit doing it and go, oh, you just shouldn't do that anymore. Like, no, I'm telling you, I'm involved heavily in it. I'm, I'm competitive and I'm telling you to be very careful to realize this happens. A lot of people are in denial. You know, they tell me I got the vaccine um, months before it. And people want to tell me that the vaccine caused it, or people want to tell me, well, what were you eating? And you know, they just want to believe it's anything but jujitsu. But it's like, once you accept that, I think you're, you can do jujitsu more safely. And my goal is to keep people in it. So to do it safely would keep people in the sport, you know, my, I love what you said about some people want to deny it. My, um, one of my good friends, who's also somebody who works for me for my painting company, um, is a smoker. He's been smoking his whole life, and um, 
he, he recently got diagnosed with emphysema. But until the time that he got the diagnosis, uh, he, he was looking for excuses and we could see him looking for excuses to blame something else other than his own actions or his own inactions. Because it's, you don't want to believe that you're harming yourself. You don't want to believe that you've done the wrong thing by yourself. Yep. Where normally it's other people that do the wrong thing by us and we can easily blame them or we can easily give them a hard time and we can easily say stuff about them that, um, you know, that it's their character and they behave this way and that impacted me negatively. And that's easy because it's somebody else. But when it's us doing it to ourselves, that's a hard thing to live with for a lot of people. They don't want to be, how do you blame yourself now? How do you attack yeah. yourself? You know, it's really difficult when supposedly you're doing what's best for you all the time. Apparently, you know, it's, it's, it's a really difficult thing. I think denial in is part of also not taking responsibility. Um, and that's what I love about your example of your sister becoming able to listen to you in training because she's realized that her staying well and safe is her responsibility in jujitsu she needs to listen so that she can stay safe and not get caught out because the other person on the mat is actually trying to make her unsafe and put her in a position where she has to submit or or in a position where she, her lights are going to go out because they're going to choke her out so it's i think it's taking responsibility is that does that resonate is that something that relates that you relate to absolutely and um man i, I feel like i'm losing the thought here i had a really good thought uh it's it's that constructive criticism is constructive for a reason and we're we're so and i'd have it i feel like most people have it i have an ego and we don't want to be told we're doing something wrong or or um, maybe we're scared to do something different than what we're comfortable with. But a lot of the time that's, that's there to aid us. And um, for her, maybe it was tough for in other areas of life, but because she knows I'm, I'm somewhat of an expert or I'm very well knowledgeable in this field, she has no problem taking the criticism. She has no problem being told, stop doing that. That's wrong. You know? And um, it, it's nice to see that she only wants to do what, is beneficial for her which would be to accept criticism and uh that's a that's like a example of really how i should be and how we all should be in life especially when we know someone knows better than us we uh we should accept criticism more often and i love it it's in the word constructive criticism it's constructing something around that criticism that's helping you later and um it's so beneficial and uh i think if we if we give the ego an opportunity to just go quiet and then really pay attention and listen, uh, I think it's easier to take criticism. But also, I think when it comes to combative sports, there's an element of survival. And I think when you're in a, in a situation of survival, you'll take constructive criticism much easier because your ego is not involved because it's survival. It's like life or death. And it might never be life or death for your sister on the, on the mat with you, but it's like, that's, that's what it feels like when you're being pinned and grappled and you're being um, subdued and you're being uh, dominated. That's definitely what the nervous system is saying. The nervous system is going, man, uh, we need to, we need to stay alive. Yep. And um, I was very bad with that. Um, from from like 14 13 when i started doing uh combat sports to uh you know about about 20 years old it was really bad i just thought my way was the way and i knew better than other people mm -hmm. somebody's done something their entire life but i don't want to listen to them because i because i've been doing this and my coach says it it's like oh, I don't want to do that because this has been working so well for me. I don't want to stop doing this. Like, yeah, it's working well on people who are not good. I'm trying to tell you that just because it's working for you, you're going to go against someone who knows what they're doing and that's going to get you in trouble. And that's where it's really hard to listen to because something is working all the time, you know? It's like, and it's not always a good example just because it's working because 
you know, if you want to work at the mediocre level for the rest of your life, then that's fine. But um, there's things that will work at the low level and then get you in trouble at the high level. And that's everything in life. How did you stay involved with the sport after the injury when you actually couldn't compete? How did you stay involved? Did you stay involved? Oh, definitely. Um, I got a direct opportunity because of it for, for something way different than I've ever done. And um, there was an event I was going to do called is called submission grappling series and um i i actually saw the promoter the day i had this show she competed at the event and um you know when i when i told them that i couldn't compete anymore and they and i told them why and they knew how devastating it was they just were like is there anything you would like to do at the event and um i just threw out there you know i i've always wanted to do commentary i'd be willing to try it they put me on the show and um i did commentary and it went really well. I studied really well for it. And um, I ended up coming back multiple times and, and I got linked with the MMA promoter. So I ended up doing lots of commentary work because of it. And um, I also started teaching the private lessons after what happened to me. So I became somewhat of a teacher after as well. Um, I wanted any way of being involved at the time. Yeah. I suppose that's that adding to your identity it's adding to that level of i'm not just a guy who gets in the ring and grapples i'm not just a a fighter i'm not just this i'm also this other person who can speak about the sport who can commentate about what's happening and that is still being involved but not necessarily directly every time so that when you have an injury you can not feel bad about it. You can be, okay, well, I'm healing now. I'm recovering. Let me dabble over here. Yeah, and it's like that knowledge now doesn't feel like it's going to waste. And maybe that's another thing that bothered me was like accumulating all this skill and all this knowledge and not knowing what I was going to do with it. It's like, I don't want to just sit on it. You know, I don't want to just pick a new career and and just go, yeah, I used to do that. Um, so being able to actually share it and people appreciated it which was one of the nicest things for me when people would message me and tell me they really liked my commentary or they thought i was really um uh they, they thought i said really nice things about them and that that really made me feel good um it didn't quite feel as good as getting in there and doing it but it, there was a good feeling that came from it i wonder if it made you a better fighter as well because i've seen whenever you see a boxing ring or an MMA ring, there's the, the team is kind of below the ring at the same height as the judges and at the same height as the commentators in the seat around the table. So they're level with the floor. And as a fighter, you're above them and you're doing your, your thing. But then as a commentator, you're actually specifically looking at their technique, the way they got there, the way they implemented that, the way they got caught out. And you're also sitting at a different level. So the perspective is completely different. Does it, does a change in perspective and the fact that you're talking about what other people are doing, observing them so intensely, does it make you a better fighter? Do you see things that you missed while you were in the ring? Yeah, a hundred percent makes you better. And, um, it's hard to ignore what you should do right when you're telling people what someone should be doing. When you're going, you know, they should be placing their arm here, they should be. And then you find yourself in that same situation and you remember what you were saying and um, it, it definitely plays into it. You're, you're analyzing it on a level you never would have before, you know? And you talk about, you watch with your friends at home and you maybe you kind of do like your own commentary but it has a lot more cuss words and like alcohol and stuff involved. But um, when it's a job and you really have to be professional, yeah, man, you, you look at it with a whole new perspective. And I think it, it adds something into your brain. It adds, it adds a new wrinkle that you never had. Yeah, there's certainly a lot more cuss words. And yeah. A lot, and a lot more alcohol and a lot more things flowing when I'm watching it with my son or with his mates or whatever. Um, yeah. I'm not big on alcohol, but yeah, it's, it's pretty electric to be in the room with them while they're watching the sport that they participate in it 
just a di- completely different feeling. I can't even imagine what it's like to be in the venue where it's happening. I cannot even imagine. I've never been so. But um, but yeah, I, and the what's interesting is that the the commentating that we do as couch commentators, I think, offers that there is a level of actually deep understanding of what's happening and how somebody caught out. We also get to see the patterns, but just because we've seen the patterns, if you put us in the ring, we would not be in any position to defend ourselves. Like, especially me, right? I could see what's happening. I could pick what's about to choke, uh, how that person's about to get move into a choke. I could pick all these things, but then I could never implement the, the strategy to protect myself against something like that because I've never had the physical experience of what it's like to be uh, completely dominated by somebody or when, when it did happen, it was when I was five and my older brother who had three years on me was doing that, right? He was sitting on me or he was, he was um, squashing me or something and I couldn't get up. But I think that the people who are, are watching the sport are definitely missing that other side of it by have never having never competed. You don't get the full appreciation of what you're experiencing. Right. It's just no, it's totally true. And uh, you know, that's like how I feel about when I watch football. Like I never played football, but I mean I love watching it. And mm. um and another thing is you don't have to be able to do it to understand what's going on because mm. a lot of the best coaches were not the best players. Mm. We're not the best fighters. I think it's rare. And it, maybe it's because of uh, the ego that somebody has to be so good. You have to have an ego. You have to be single-minded. So I think a lot of the best coaches are not the best when they competed. You know, there's, there's some former world champions who are good coaches, but a lot of them are not, you know, a lot of them were guys who maybe in the amateur ranks or, um, you know, competed a bit, but um, they just had the understanding and the know-how, but maybe not the physical uh, gifts and whatnot. So you seem to be able to, the way you're talking makes me feel like you'd be able to switch on and off. You switch on your ego and then you switch off your ego. Is that true? Yes, yes, for sure. And I got an ego. Um, I definitely have an ego. I'm not afraid to admit that. Yeah, I, I, I've had a high sense of self-importance from a, from a young age. Is that what made it difficult but, for people to relate to you, for you to have friendships and all those things in those early years? Is that what was hard about you not knowing where you belonged and fit in? Or was that part of it? I think that was part of it. Um, I think I was very out there too. I'm a very, I'm very strange guy. Um, I have a very strange sense of humor. Um, And what I tell people really often is that the things people didn't like me for and thought I was weird for when I was young are the same things people really like me for as an adult. So I'm, I'm very happy with adulthood. Um, I don't feel like I have to put up a mask or anything anymore. So So that, that, Maybe you were just quicker to adopt behavior than most adolescents and teenagers. Maybe you just got there sooner. You were, maybe you were uh, uh, mature for your age or something. I was an old soul, but I'm also, I don't know how I can be mature for my age, but then I can be really immature too. I'm, like I said, I'm a very strange guy. Um, you know, the more you know me, you'll, you'll start figuring it out. Um, yeah. I remember you know, I had smoked weed for so long. Uh, I finally quit uh, January and some people thought maybe it would get better. It is 10 times worse now. Like now, you know, the real me and I'm insane. So uh, it's pretty funny seeing, seeing my friends go like, wow, I, th- I thought that would make it a little better. But, um, but no. I think weirdness and, um, and all that behavior, I think it's appropriate in the right context, like anything, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I don't want to be um, overly uh... rigid in a funny environment. You don't want to be the stiff in the room when everyone's supposed to be laughing and vice versa. You don't want to be the guy that's making people laugh in the funeral while it's happening. Like, Yeah, maybe. that's a good way to put it. You know, 
you know and rigidness rigidness disturbs me um there's something very off-putting to me about people who are afraid to uh open up and, and I, I won't say be yourself but just be like silly like um that that for some reason bothers me um it's hard for me to make friends with you if you can't uh make fun of yourself or make fun of everything that's going on around you yeah. i gotta say and uh, that the jokes never stopped the, i mean when i was in the hospital with a stroke I had the mask on half of my face and I was pretending to be the guy from 300 who was missing an eye. <laughs> so like it, it literally never stopped. Even when I was crying, it, it's like one minute I'd be crying and the next minute I'd be making a really stupid joke about me being blind or whatever. So uh, that's just me. I can't help it. I don't think you need to apologize for it. I think it's a really amazing thing because it helps. That's what helps people get through. I mean, the dark times can be really dark you need a way out and you need to experience every level of emotion because if you don't experience it, those are the mo emotions that kind of hang around and cause problems later on in life. The ones you've never dealt with or the ones you've never uh, allowed to, to come forward or the ones you've never faced, you know? So yes, you have to experience them all. And I think laughter is one of those little, it's one of those bridges that gets you to the next one. And it gives you a bit of respite, gives you a bit of a release. And it also gives you good endorphins. And it gives you, I imagine, serotonin and all other stuff that we need in our body. And it gives us kind of like a little gap, a little bit of respite to get us to the next shitty time or shitty feeling or whatever it is. And then and then hopefully we've dealt with a lot of them by the time we've we've been beyond our stroke mm -hmm. for a number of years. You know, I I certainly have been in counseling since about the age of 25, about your age. And I do not I have not stopped yet. I'll be turning 48 this year and I still go to counseling regularly because I do all those things that I'm saying but I'm not always good at talking through things with the right person. It's difficult to find the right person to talk things through with so that I can a, get them out of my head, out of my soul, out of my heart, wherever I need to get them out of. And then, and that, and all we do at work all day is poke fun at each other all day. There's five of us, nobody gets away with it. And sometimes, <laughs> And you can see when somebody's had enough, when they finally go, that's it. I'm not, I can't take another joke anymore from you and just shut up and don't talk to me. You know, they're going through something else at that moment. And then it's time to sort of settle back and let it go. But the, but the, all the laughter of all the days before made it possible for us to get through our day. And now he's at that moment and now laughter is not appropriate. And so, right. okay. Now let's stop and let, let's let them get deal with that, overcome that. And let's get back to laughter and poking fun at each other when it's time. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be able to read people on that. And um, yeah, it's like, that's why I'm always laughing at myself. I don't want to laugh at anybody else, but I know I can laugh at myself because I know how I feel. So yeah, I mean, my friend, my friend called me when I was in the hospital and he was crying and um that, that really touched me in a different way too. I mean, I really felt close to, I've never, never forgot that. But um, I mean, I was like trying to make him feel better. I was saying some, I wish I could remember the kind of stuff I was saying, but I was still trying to make him laugh because I mean, he's, we competed against each other. Um, I beat him at a tournament earlier last year and um, we just became really close after and we kind of both agreed we're going to, we're going to become world champions one day. We're going to chase our dreams together. And uh, when he saw that happen to me, it just kind of devastated him. And it was, it was at that moment, I just was like almost trying to make him feel better, even though it was for me. Mm. I was like, I just didn't want to see him be upset. Well, a lot of strokes uh, survivors talk about trying to make the other people in the room feel better when they come to visit. That's a very yeah. common thing. I, I certainly was doing that for all my family. The more I could be quote unquote myself, the less worried or stressed out they would be. And it, it worked for some people, but it didn't work for others. It didn't work for my mum and dad, of course. They 
they, they there was no getting bringing them back off the cliff you know they were they were a mess my dad um i remember the first uh the first day i was in hospital um so i got diagnosed on a friday we went in for the after ignoring the signs and symptoms for seven days i finally went to hospital and got diagnosed and it was about 9 a 9 p.m when i was told there's something we noticed something on your brain but i told my wife to go home and look after the kids at the time they were teenagers young teenagers and i didn't tell my wife either but the next morning i rang my wife i said hey listen um they told me they found something and take the kids to my parents and come and see me in the hospital and we'll talk through it with the doctors they're going to come in so tell my parents nothing don't tell them exactly what's happening just yet because we don't know and we'll tell them later but tell them i'm in hospital and they need to come and see me right so my wife does that drops off the kids the kids get all looked after or whatever and then my parents come to see me but my dad that forgets to take his blood pressure medication my dad's six foot something right six foot one he forgets to take and he's about in kilos is about 140 kilos which is it's big right it's about yeah i'm 77 so it's a lot yeah right so i, I want to convert it quickly to pounds for for our american viewers yeah we're like what is that what is a kilo um it's 308 pounds yeah it's a lot right so he forgets to take his blood pressure medication and and out of their home into their backyard there are two steps down to the ground he takes one step down he gets feels dizzy loses his balance and he falls into the courtyard and my mom is half his size and a third of his weight and now my dad on the way to come and see me has collapsed at home they were such a mess right my parents were a mess so there yeah was your no poor bringing, mother yeah there was no bringing them back from the the brink of you know jumping off the cliff and i remember going to the my mum comes up to the ward to see me and i'm like where's dad and she said well he's downstairs or what what the hell is he doing downstairs well you know he fell over at the house and he's in emergency and i'm like what's going on so i'm still able to walk and talk and do all that stuff in the first part of the bleed like the first bleed that i had still had me looking perfectly normal nobody could tell that there was something wrong other than me <clears throat> i walk downstairs and i go and see my dad is lying in emergencies connected to all the monitors and i'm dude what happened to you man he goes i collapsed i fell over he goes i was coming to see you and i forgot to take my blood pressure medication and look at me you know i came to help you and now i can't even do that he was a mess he was a complete mess so i couldn't bring them back from the seriousness of it until they knew that i was okay and i answered the question are you okay a uh, 101 million times until that time it was i was not okay and that was for a lot lot a long time a lot of years i couldn't get them to just chill out and um be comfortable with the fact that when i actually told them i was okay i was okay they were also adjusting yeah. with the new me because i'd be fatigued some days or some days i wouldn't be up for a visit or sometimes i wouldn't go and see them or whatever and they struggled a lot so i'm not sure yeah how, i'm not sure i got to this point but yeah that's um that's my experience with ah oh, it was your friend who really felt sort of really upset for you and you were trying to make him feel better are they yeah. okay are your friends and family okay now or are they still kind of harboring a few concerns there i think they're always gonna um have some concerns i've calmed them down immensely i think the longer i've been training and now i've competed three times they're starting to accept that like i can do this and i'm gonna be okay um that one friend though he he actually i mean everybody who does jujitsu is like really like oh you're fine he's the only one who's like still like 
like I've talked about us jokingly like competing again. He's like, I do not want to go against you. He's like, I just don't want to try to choke you. Like I just can't, you know. And he he he's it just shows me how much he cares about me though. I mean, he gets really worried um every time, you know, he just kind of is relieved when it's over. And uh, you know, he never because my parents have said some things that uh bother me. Like, you know, I'm doing the biggest competition of my life. I'm going to Las Vegas April 1st. And, you know, I told my mom about it. And she's like, well, you're going to tap if they get you in a choke, right? And, like, that's not what I was hoping to hear. I was hoping to hear, oh, good luck. Or, you know, I, I think you'll do good or whatever. You know, like, oh, what what an awesome opportunity. It was, that's the first thing that goes in her head because she could care less what I, you know, she just wants me to be okay. Um but they're a little bit more at ease. Um, they're a little bit more at ease. Yeah. And that's the thing about knowing when to tap is really important too, isn't it? For the up people that are up and coming who are not yet able to defend somebody coming in to choke them, that's really good. It's really important to know in the training phase when to tap. Yeah. And um, when, when there's no escape, don't wait for pain to start happening. Don't wait till you're about to pass out. If you're not actively trying to escape, it's really over. I mean, let alone if like you feel the choke coming, maybe even if you feel like you can't escape, but the choke is on, you got to just, you know, accept it. And, and you get to restart. That's the beauty of it. You can fix your mistakes. You can think about what you did wrong and you can fix it. It's okay that you got caught. You know, it's not like you're actually going to get better if you somehow survive this, you know? it's like this weird mentality we have where if we didn't tap out, we did something right that day or we did. It's like, you were wrong for even getting caught in the first place. And um, the other thing I was thinking about was how I had all those major vision issues um, that lasted for like a year where, where uh, my peripherals would get really dark. I'd see things spinning um, just the, the lights, everything would just get really strange. And I went to an eye doctor and I was totally fine in regards to my eyeballs, they're still totally fine. There's nothing wrong with my eyeballs. And um, I kind of just wrote that off as, okay, don't do that. If, if, if you have vision issues and there's nothing wrong with your eyes, it probably is something with your brain. So, you know, go see a neurologist, I would say, and get an evaluation on that because it could be maybe a sign of, of a, like a miniature stroke or something. Cause I think that's what was happening with me. Yes. Yeah, man, that's a great thing to to say because vision issues that come out of nowhere is not your eyeball; it's something else. Uh, it could also right. be your eyeball, and that could be some deterioration in your eyeball. But even that's serious, right? Even that's something that you need to yeah. do something about. Get it looked at. Yeah, but your optometrist or your ophthalmologist or whatever they're called. When you go there and they look at your eye, they'll say, your eye looks perfectly healthy. There must be something else causing your vision issues. And they know the next thing to say to you is, go and see uh, a neurologist, go to the hospital, go and get a scan. They'll know that that's the next thing to say. And yeah, and I wish they did that with me. They didn't do that with me. You know, wow. they just said, well, your eyes are fine. You know, they, they never said that. Um, wow. They just said yeah. my eyes were fine. Yeah, so your eyes were fine. They didn't look beyond the eye. Your eye, yeah, your eye, your eye was physically healthy. And perhaps that's one of the things we, we don't know what to ask them to get them to give us the right response so that we could take action in hindsight. Yeah. How do I wish I was more, I wish I was more curious about what was wrong with me instead of, because we just want to keep training. That's the other thing I'd say about athletes. If we can get any kind of clearance from a doctor that says, no, you're okay. We're going to take that and run with it. We're not going to let, I told you I had, I went to five doctors. Four of them told me never to do it again. One told me that it was possible. Guess who I'm listening to. <laughs> yeah. I know, man. Look, right. Life is actually full of risks. Every single day you get in a car, <laughs> you get into a plane you and and a car is way more dangerous than a plane by the way um you walk down the street life is a risk every single thing that we do every time that we do and we cannot live life 
trying to avoid death or trying to avoid risk or trying to avoid injury. It should be in the back of our minds, but I don't think it's necessarily going to need to be in the front of our minds because it's going to rob us from life. And I am certainly never jumping out of an airplane. I'm never jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. I'm okay with that. It's not robbing me of life. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. But I tell you what, there are definitely things that I'm going to do if somebody says to me, should we do that? If I can do a, a very quick risk to reward calculation and the reward is immense and the risk is ma manageable, then I'm going for it. Because I, I did change That's my it. perspective on how I'm going to experience life as well. At 37, I was pretty narrow minded. I was pretty rigid, narrow minded about people, pretty rigid about life. Uh, and I think I was sometimes as funny as I was in my own little world, or as good as I was, I was bloody boring, because I always said no to things. I always said, Oh, man, we need to do that later. Or we don't, I used to find the excuse, oh, we don't have enough money for that now or whatever. And it was such a load of shit. Um, and my wife had to deal with me saying no and no and no and no to any to everything yeah. for her entire time that she was with me, you know, like and still is. But but from 37, when she said we have to do this now that we're healthy enough to do it, because later on we don't know what's coming. And I'm like, you know what, you're right. But I still couldn't get my head around being the one that organized it. I had to outsource it to her and say, oh, listen, if you arrange it. I'll come along. I don't know why I can't arrange it, but if you do arrange it, I'll be there. Let, let yeah. me not overthink it. I'll let you do all the programming or calculations, whatever you need to do, you do that and I'll just turn up and we'll have a lovely experience. And I think I was trying to allay my, my concerns and my anxiety by not being involved in the lead up. Right. And now it's like, well, she's booked it all. We've got to go. We can't not go. And it's like, all right, I'm there. I'll go. And then I had the best times. And most of that was traveling, right? One of the first things yeah. that we did, we went to, um, we came to the US, you know, we traveled to the US and we, we did Hawaii, we did California, and we did um, New York. And in Australia, one of the things that we get to see every New Year's is the ball drop at Times Square. It's like, that's what they show here. We, we get to see Times Square and the people there and all that stuff. So my wife said, wouldn't it be good if we went to Times Square to see the ball drop, you know, New Year's? I'm like, yeah, that would be good. So we were so far away from it, you couldn't actually experience the ball drop. But I had my camera and I zoomed right in and I could actually see the ball drop on my camera. And we were there. And it was freezing cold, you know, in New York, in um, I think it was 2012 and it was going into 2013 it was freezing cold. There was millions of people on the street. Um, we were there with the whole family and I never would have had that experience. I don't believe if it wasn't for me experiencing a stroke and then thinking that I might not live to see another day. I totally, I, I feel like a lot of the revelations that you had are the same ones that I've had. And, and I would, I would imagine a lot of other people, but mm -hmm. it's, I keep saying, it's like, I got to bite the bullet. Um, and it's like you said, when your wife booked it, now you got no choice. And it's like, that's what I'm kind of doing now. It's like, let me just, let me just send it. Let me just press yes. And then now I have to do it. And, uh, and I'm always going to be happy that I did it. Yeah. And it's like, we, we always, like you were kind of it's like we always think we're gonna find the time for it later but it's never right now and it's like we have to do things right now we can't put everything off to later because later just becomes later again so like we have to do it now yeah and uh i'm excited to go to vegas um oh, man. you know i that's gonna be interesting and and i my bracket is gonna have 250 people i signed up when there was about 237 so there was only about 13 spots left. And I was like, I better do this now because I'm going to regret. It's another thing that I would have normally went maybe next year. And it's like, why not just do it now? Why not just try it? So did you put it off and put it off and put it off until that 
right, almost the last moment. Yeah, and I almost, I almost was a victim of of putting things off again, but wow. I, I just did it. I just, I was at the gym. I, I was kind of, I was lifting weights, so you know, I could have told myself I'll do it when I get home. Maybe I wouldn't have had enough time if I got home though. So I just, I just sat down on a bench and I just did it. And much, uh, that's something I would have, huh? I was going to say, how much harder is it now for somebody to choke you out now that you've had that injury and you want to totally protect yourself? Are you better at being able to protect yourself um, in the ring? Way better. Um, I rarely have to tap the chokes because I'm a million miles away from any choke attempt, you know? If they happen to get to it, I do tap. And um, even when it's something weird with my neck, where I normally, when I'm allowed to neck crank, it's not a choke. Um, but but uh, it's way harder now because I just keep my I just keep myself safe. And I think a lot of the time that I got submitted or that I get submitted because I'm at the point where I'm pretty good is when I'm consciously lazy. It's like because I know what I need to do a lot of the time, and I'll do it. And when you can make me work hard enough to finally go, you know, and like relax, then you can grab something. So it's when, when I'm, when someone's aware, it's very hard to get them, you know, when somebody's active and aware. So I, I'd say it just makes me more conscious. Consciously lazy. Consciously lazy. That's so you're aware that you're going into a lazy phase. And still and... being lazy. Wow. A lot of the losses I've had were like that. Um, it's like, I'm tired. I've, I've almost told myself I'm not going to win this one. I've, I've done that a few times, you know? And, and a lot of the losses I've had, it was like, not today. You know, not all of them. And those are the losses I'm least bothered by, ones where I just was trying as hard as I could throughout. But mm -hmm. the ones that bother me most, it's not about getting submitted or anything. It's about the fact that I consciously accepted defeat. One, mm -hmm. on, the, on the tournament where I had a stroke, I lost. I, went th I won three matches. I lost one. And that loss is one of the ones that I'm least bothered by because I was losing by a lot of points. And I just decided I was going to do something really risky because I had nothing to lose. I knew I was going to lose if I let the time run out. So I took a big risk and then he got, he got my leg and he tapped me out with the heel hook, which is a type of leg lock. And uh, I had absolutely no issue with it because it was like, I didn't watch the clock run out. The worst, the worst thing to me is watching the clock run out mm. and, and knowing that you're going to lose when the time runs out. I'd rather get submitted. Everybody's different. I know people who would rather survive. They go, at least I didn't get submitted. That's not me. Losing is losing to me, and you can lose by an inch, you can lose by a mile. You still lost. It's Same thing when I win, though. If I, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, that's all right. I was going to say it's interesting because in sport, I hate teams that watch the clock out while they're while they're winning, and they get the win and they get the points, and I get it. They might even get the trophy because of that, but it's such a terrible way to watch a sport when you know you're not even giving the opposition a chance to beat you and then beating them to show that you actually are better than them. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. And uh, you know, but there's a reason that, um, you know, when there's a certain amount of time on the clock, you, you kneel, it's like, why, why give them a chance? I understand both mentalities. So why give them a chance that you don't need to, mm -hmm. but as a, as a spectator, it's never fun. You don't want to watch somebody mm -hmm. like, go for the win over the excitement but i gotta tell you another thing i've lost excitingly and i've won boringly mm -hmm. and i got way more support when i won boringly people like seeing this people like seeing your hand raised people people don't care that much it turns out because i was not happy with my first performance coming back but i won and everybody was just freaking overjoyed i was like eh, it wasn't the best performance they don't care they don't care they just want to see you win the okay. Patriots can win by three points for the rest of time and their fans will be happy. I'm telling you, man. Yeah. I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. We had um, in the um, 500 cc's, we had a, uh, a motorcycle rider, Mick Dorn, who was the best for many, many yeah. years. He was about six time world champ. 
and he was just dominating the sport, dominating the sport, dominating. There was nobody. Uh, there was nobody uh, that was anywhere near his level of uh, dominance for the time that he was um, at his peak. And they were talking about him as being the person who's making the sport boring. Yeah. Um, you know, there's something I've to say it. about that. And, and it's, and it's not, it's not about him. It's about the people coming up behind him who are not up to the task. That's yeah. what it's about. And exactly. And yet he gets the criticism for making the sport boring, but the the rest of the field is just they're the boring ones. They're the ones that can't actually um, compete at that level. So yeah, it's an interesting philosophical conversation. Um, but I hear you. I would rather you uh, you personally as a as a spectator is not watch the clock. I would rather you right do all those things, you know, I would rather you um, be, be given the opportunity to, to win. And then the other person shows you that they are the true uh, dominant fighter by beating you because they actually are better than you in every way, shape or form. I don't know. Like, it's just me. But if I was on the mat, you know, maybe that completely all that stuff I just said goes completely out the window and that's perfectly fine as well. So I'm speaking from a naive base from no real experience in the sport. So who am I to say, I would, I would rather let you guys make your own decisions and, 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 and yeah. feel comfortable by them or, or not feel comfortable by them. And that's fine and learn from them. You're somebody that's learned so much from combat sports so much from stroke and together the lessons have really shaped you to be a way a way i don't, know, I don't even know what the words are like such a such a multi-faceted multi-level person yeah. who i well, think is going to continue to do that right now that you know how to do that and how to be less rigid and how to be less yeah. narrow-minded I need to be a more well-rounded uh, person, you know, yeah. like every, every, every personality trait needed to be a little better because yeah. again, it was just too much tunnel vision for me. And, you know, and then I had real tunnel vision and now I see more, you know, I was more blind when I could see more. Wow. Man, that is an awesome way to end the podcast, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And um, I really appreciate you making three hours available of your time for me. One and a half hours for last week that we didn't get to record and another about that much this time. So man, I wish you all the best. I'm going to follow your, uh, your career. I want to, I want to see what you do in the sport and how you grow as a person, how you develop at 25. You've got a lot of living to do, man. And you're going to actually, mm -hmm. You're gonna you're gonna make a massive difference to a lot of people, not only in the sport but also in the other side of life. You know this this other part that you now kind of um, had to learn from and grow from. Yep, I'm happy to be a part of multiple communities. And uh, before we go, before we close, I do want to because it's something I said last week, but I just want people to know that um, a stroke doesn't mean you're a disabled person. You're only as disabled as you feel. So there's always a way to get back to doing what you love. And it, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but, you know, don't lose hope on, on living a, a good, fulfilling life. There's always more to do. So I just want everybody to know that. Yeah. And I, I, and I have to add to that. Just look at those world champion Paralympians, tennis players, um, all those people who decided that they were going to go jumping out of a plane after they had a massive injury or something, or all those people who are rock climbing with just their arms because their legs don't work. I mean, it doesn't mean anything that life has changed. Absolutely. That it's a bit harder, a lot harder, more mentally harder, more emotionally harder, all those things, but with practice and with work and with, um, focus on how to get beyond the problem rather than stay at the problem so what are the solutions on going after the solutions you can live a massive life and an unbelievable life 
And if it's early days in your recovery, or if it's early days in your in your disease, or if you're unwell, and it's still early days, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There really, really yes. is. Yes, it gets better. It gets better. You learn to deal with it. And as we know, sometimes the life that you live after is more rewarding. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to be the same, but that's okay. It's okay that you're not the same because you're better than before a lot of yeah. the time. Yeah. And discover who you are. Go, go about discovering who you are. I mean, that's a perfect time to do that. Discover now. And I'll add this as well. And, you know, and start saying yes, like I did a couple of weeks ago when my, my wife and her sister decided to go and get the nails, um, the nails done, right? So I, I was went, hoping you tell this story. I wanted yeah. you to tell this story again. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So I'm going to then, as a result, I'll share the photo of my foot as well, my feet as well, right? And maybe <laughs> please do. I'll share the photos of me actually in the chair while I was getting um, the pedicure for the first time in my life, man, I'm 47. I can't believe I haven't had a pedicure yet, right? The girl yeah. said to me, are we going to catch up on this Saturday afternoon in Melbourne in the city? And I said, yeah, we'll catch up for sure. Are we going get, to get a pedicure? And I'm like, yeah, we're going to go get a pedicure. <laughs> <laughs> so we went, I had no idea. They, they knew what they were doing. And, you know, my sister-in-law was sitting opposite me. So I said, to look, take photos of me. I'm going to send it to my nieces, you know. And my nieces were just loving it. They were just chewing it up. They were like, man, that's so cool, whatever. And then, yeah. and then the, um, the Thai lady, uh, it's the standard typical all around the world. It's all Thai people that run uh, nail, um, nail shops, right? Um, she they're talking about us you know for sure they're talking about me and I'm really loving it about me uh, in their own language to each other and I'm like fantastic this is the entire I'm having the entire experience here you know and then at the beginning she didn't notice that the lady who was um, working with me she didn't notice that I had picked up nail polish and I was holding it just in my lap and just waiting there while she finished. And she thought we were done after she did the nail clip and the polishing and whatever they do and the massaging and the cream. And man, my feet felt like so, so pampered. They were amazing. Right. <laughs> and then, um, and then she goes all done now. And I said, no, no, not all done nail polish. And she looked at me, what you want nail polish? Yeah. And I picked the most brightest orange nail polish you can imagine. And I said to do that. And she was shocked. And my, my sister-in-law was like, yeah, of course you're going to get nail polish. And my wife's like, nail polish? And I'm like, yeah, nail polish. What's the point of going all the way to a pedicure and leaving without nail polish, man? It's like a ripper. Yeah. You need the full experience. Yeah, man. So um, it's been such a great thing for me to do because, of course, there was a, there used to be a guy in my head that had many things to say about people especially men who went and got um, pedicures and nail polish. That guy, I'm so glad to say, does not exist anymore. And, you know, right. that guy fucking left 10 years ago. And let me tell you, that's the best thing that it, one of the best things that's ever happened to me amongst all the hundreds and hundreds of other amazing things that's happened since stroke. So, um, so yeah, whoever's listening to this, if you stay to the end, go to find the episode uh, in the show notes and scroll down to the bottom of the page. Just it's at recoveryafterstroke.com. Check out this episode and then see Jake. You'll see Jake's image there. Click on that, go into the show notes, scroll right down to the bottom. I'm not going to make it easy for you. And you'll see the images of my <laughs> fabulous um, orange nails uh, after the pedicure. <laughs> I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah. <laughs> do it, man. Do it. Jake. Um, it's been fun. So much fun again, talking to you. So thank you for doing it again. And I really look forward to, uh, like I said, following your career and I wish you well in your comp in the competition and, um, man, I'm written for you, man. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that, uh, I'm there. If you ever need anything, you know, please reach out. Appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me. I really love what you're doing. So I'll be following you as well. This is uh this is a really great thing that we've been brought together. So I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, 
thanks so much for joining us again on another episode of the recovery after stroke podcast i hope you got something out of it and i hope that you uh appreciate going to and checking out the photos of my feet after my uh pedicure and nail polish experience it was something different and uh I've got to say it was real, real lots, lots of fun. And I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed connecting with my wife and my sister in law in that way, which is something I've never done before. So uh, do go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes, and then find your uh, find find this episode with Jake Strauss episode 188. And check out the photos of me sitting in the chair. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, please comment, like, share, tell me what you think. If you're watching on Insta, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, leave the show a thumbs up, subscribe, hit the notification bell to get uh, notifications of new episodes as they're being released. And if you leave a comment, that helps the episode rank better and therefore it'll go to more people. The algorithm will make it so that it goes through and it is seen by more people. That will hopefully make it better for people who are stroke survivors searching for this type of content, find it and feel less alone, feel less stressed and upset about the situation they find themselves in. And hopefully that'll make a difference in their recovery and their loved ones who are helping them with their recovery. So thanks so much again for listening. Like I said, leave us a comment. I answer all comments myself, leave a thumbs up. Uh, like and share and I really appreciate you tuning in every episode and um, making this show possible thank you so much importantly we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience and we do not necessarily share the same opinion nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed all content on this website and any linked blog podcast or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of bill gassiamis the content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.